Welcome to the Faith Legacy Series, which is designed to help families grow spiritually. This series helps parents and teens connect around important topics through the preteen and teen years. Presenting the seminar are Jeff and Debbie McElroy, who have founded Forever Families, a ministry to help families be strong. Jeff and Debbie's presentation will help you see sex from God's perspective and how to pursue sexual purity. Let's listen in as Jeff and Debbie speak to a group of teens and their parents about this important topic. Hey, this is a pretty good group, actually. You guys actually like, look like you love each other, or, or you're good at acting like it anyway. <laughs> um, it's pretty cool, I think, that this church is putting together something like this for families, because families aren't easy to be able to deal with. Uh, as a matter of fact, let's make sure I guess we have the normal audience. Oh, yes. I just want to ask a question. How many of you are from a family? Yes? Quick show of hands. Just any, any, okay, good, okay, good. great, I'm right, glad, okay. Helpful. And then how many of you would be willing to say that somewhere in your family, that you can, you know, you can include like cousins, aunts, grandparents, somewhere in your family, there's a problem. Anybody got any kind of problem in your family? I know okay. it's tough okay. to be honest in church, I know. How about this one? How many would say that that problem is seated right next to you? Come on, raise your hand. Yeah. yeah. Now, I knew, I knew I'd see some hands. Yeah, now you're probably throwing <laughs> each other under the bus. Well, uh, just to let you guys know a little bit about us, I used to work for IBM. Debbie taught school. We lived in Houston. That's where we both grew up, Houston, Texas. And we worked with the youth at our church. And eventually we were asked by other church youth groups to come and speak to their groups and we would lead camps and retreats. And um, after a while, people would go, oh, that is so cool that you're working with teenagers. And, and we were loving it and we left our jobs and we just committed our lives to that. And then uh, people would start to say, so what is wrong with kids today since you work with them? And we tell them, look, we figured out nine out of 10 of the kids would be okay if we could get the parents straightened out. So yes. just so <laughs> that the teenagers are clear on who we're here to work on, okay? So um, we just thought we'd ask a couple of questions about you guys and your parents, just to kind of get a feel for the group. Uh, quick show of hands, how many of you have fathers who when your friends come around, he thinks he is a comedian, but he is only funny to himself? Are you you can't get in trouble That's right. asking these questions tonight. You That's cannot right. get in trouble. You cannot no. get voted off the island for being That's honest, right. okay? Yes, yeah, I see a job. lot of hands out there, Dad. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. Uh, pretty sad. I'm not that way. My, oh. my kids would not raise their hand to that. Uh, yes, he did. He had his hand up. Um, just so that you kids know why uh, we dads do that, it's to get you back. Um, it, for stuff that you've done to us to humiliate us. Uh, when my son was like still on the high chair, we were at a restaurant, and um, we're feeding him crackers while we're waiting for the food. And uh, I didn't notice that he wasn't swallowing any of the crackers that he was taking in. And about the point that I realized, man, this guy's working up a big cracker glob because his cheeks are starting to bulge. <laughs> about that point, his nose does this, just starts to crinkle like he's about to sneeze. And it was just like instantaneous. And all of a sudden he sneezes and this cracker cannonball comes at me at the speed of light. And I, all I had time to do was to duck to save yes. myself. At which point it goes... <laughs> and hits the lady in the booth right back behind us. And she's, she's the lady that's got like the blue hair that's been plastered with all the hairspray. And it just hits and I turn around and it's just slowly it's like doing this thing. And she doesn't even feel it because she's got like a helmet of hairspray back there. And I was just like, I picked Trevin up. I just told the waiter on the way out, here's the money for the food we've ordered, but we're leaving. And so <laughs> I wrote that on my list. And I said, someday I will get this boy back for that. So that's, that's part right. of the reason that we do that, just so you guys that's know. That's right. Um, how about um, moms? How many of you have mothers who know more about your friends' personal lives than you do? They know who they're dating and exactly what's going on. They check their Facebook pages. This is embarrassing. They yeah. say things like they try to keep up with all the really cool things to say and they sound really dumb. How many dumb of you have moms that try that little it? number? Using yes. your lingo? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Try to use the text lingo and everything oh, yeah. and just completely <laughs> L -O -L. <embarrassing>. <laughs> yeah. Okay, mom, really. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I heard one mom said she used TMI information. So she was so proud of herself. She said, I just texted TMI information. I went, really? You texted that to your child? She said, yes, I did. And I went, well, your child will need counseling for that little miss text because information is already in the eye. So you just said too much information information. Aren't I cool? So we've had one mother, actually, this was a year ago. This saying is about a decade ago. This mother comes up and she goes, isn't my daughter great? She's just cool beans. And I went, wow, that's going to cost you several counseling sessions. Um, how many of you have moms who when you go shopping 
She picks out the clothes for you to try on that would have been fine like back in fifth grade. Anybody? Yes. Picks the clothes out way Wait, too mom. young. Or, okay. or moms and dads, it treats you like you're way younger than you really are. How many of you have problems with this? They, <laughs> they act like you're still in elementary school. And, and don't you hate that when she brings in like the little frilly dress for you to try on? You're like, mom, seriously, the lace and the pink was cute in fifth grade, but I am in ninth or tenth grade now, so get rid of the dress. Besides that, I'm a guy. Let it go. I, <laughs> I know you're paying. I remember that well. Um, how many of you have dads or parents, moms or dads, that worry over ridiculous stuff? Yes, how many of you have this problem? They must stay up late thinking of things to worry about. Yes, yeah. yes, parents do this sometimes. Yeah, and, and let me ask this. How many of you have parents who want to control you? Parents who want to, it's okay, you can raise your hand. Okay. You are you're free to tell on them tonight. Okay, let me explain what happens here. Your parents really don't want to control you. They do want to control your world. I'll prove it to you. How many of you have heard this until you're ready to vomit? It's not that I don't trust you. It's that I don't trust all, all the, the other, other people. people. How many of you have heard this? Yes. Multiple times. Yes. Okay, mm -hmm. it's true. I promise you, it's true. See, the most painful thing that can happen to a parent is what? Something to hurt their child, right? Right. Now, it was easy to control your world when you were a baby because your world was in their arms. So if somebody was sick or strange, they just didn't come into your world. Mm -hmm. But then your world started to grow when you started to crawl. So they had to go to extra precaution to control your world. They had to put like those plugs in the electrical socket so you wouldn't stick your tongue in there. <laughs> they had to put those uh, things on the cabinet so that you nor they could ever get back in that cabinet. <laughs> and, and so it became harder to control your world. And then you started to ride a bike. And your first trip around the block was a great adventure for you. Your mom was on Prozac for a week getting prepared for that trip around the block. And you don't know this, but she had sentries stationed at every corner of the block with radios that had to call in. The baby has rounded the corner <laughs> just so she can make sure you're okay. And now some of you have started to drive. Anybody there? You're, you're either practice driving yeah. or you know, you're doing your learner's permit yeah. year or you're about to drive. Our son turns 16 tomorrow and he is more than ready to take over the wheel. But this is when you start saying things that you never thought that you would say. Yeah. As a matter of fact, let me just ask you, parents, how many of you, um, when, when you were growing up, there were certain things that your parents did and you thought to yourself, when I am a parent, I will never. Go ahead, raise your hand. Did you think that? When I am a parent, I will Seriously, never. Seriously, four of you are telling the truth Come right on. now. Yes, I will never. Yes. Yeah, and how many of you are doing what you said you'd never do? Come on, fess up. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, I, I always said that I will never go chasing cars that drive through th too fast through our neighborhood like my dad did in his boxers. <laughs> I don't know if you've had this happen yet, but if not, thank God for your dad. My dad would get mad because people were driving through too fast through the neighborhood. He'd go running out there going, I don't want to ever see you driving through this neighborhood again. I was like, Dad, please get inside and get clothes on before you ever do that again. Um, and your moms will say stuff. If you're five minutes late, your mom is freaking. Oh, yes. Has your mom ever said this one? I thought you were dead in a ditch on the side of the road somewhere. Do you know how much you make me worry? And really, how many dead people do you see laying in ditches on the side of the road? I mean, this is just not logical. It's just something that happens. The bigger you get, the older you get, the bigger your world becomes. And your parents get hypervigilant trying to protect you from the world. So they try to control the world. And because of that, they, they just kind of go overboard. They start to worry about crazy stuff. My dad was the poster child for Prozac. That dude can worry. <laughs> I mean, still to this day, he still, when we're going on a trip, he will check the weather channel to call me to tell me what the weather is. Yes. So I know how to dress as though I don't have <laughs> cable on my own and can check the weather. And so he's just always been like that, worried about stuff. And I used to think, you know, when I become a parent, I'm not going to worry like my dad does. Well, here's the problem. Just saying you're not going to do what your parents do doesn't work. You have to actually understand why your parents do this. And my dad came from just a real chaotic household. A lot of people did get hurt in his household. There was just a lot of um, upheaval going on. And so he worries because of that. And uh, I never asked myself why. I never tried to understand it. And so now I worry about mm -hmm. stuff. 
And I, I don't intend to. I trust both my kids, you know, explicitly. But I, I worry about everything. You I, worry about crazy stuff that is never going to happen. I don't, I don't know what happens. I just figure out how to go to the worst possible case scenario. Any other parents do this? Mm -hmm. Without even meaning to. Seriously, what do we need to pray right now <laughs> yes. for the sin of lying happening in this room right now? I'll make other parents probably feel better about yourself. Um, things have kept me up late at night. Um, like there, there used to be a Taco Bell commercial campaign um, where they had this chihuahua as their spokesperson. Do you remember this? Where this little chihuahua would say, Yo quiero Taco Bell. And that was supposed to sell food to people. Yes. A couple of things bothered me about that. First of all, who's the guy in the ad agency? who's in the brainstorming section, they're going, okay, who's got a great idea to take Taco Bell from the bottom of the fast food chain to the top? Who's got a good idea? Who's the guy that thought it first of all and then said out loud, let's hire a dog to sell food to people? <laughs> and they vote on this and decide, that is such a great idea, we're gonna put millions of dollars behind the concept of hiring an animal to sell food to people. Now what freaks me out even more is, it worked. That little chihuahua made Taco Bell successful. And let's just be honest, chihuahuas are not like a sweet little dog that sings love songs across the alleyway, the, like, the way they had that dog doing in the commercials. A chihuahua, if you have one, I'm sorry to offend you, is a yapper dog. Can we just be honest on that a level? A yapper dog. The only thing a chihuahua is good for is if your doorbell no longer works and you need something to alert you that someone has just entered your zip code, then a chihuahua <laughs> would be good for you. Chihuahuas are not happy dogs. I don't blame them. I know what happened. It started out as a Doberman pincher. Somebody left in the dryer too long. <laughs> and everything shrunk but his eyes, okay? So I understand why he's not happy. I just, I can't believe it worked. And, and we don't even know what we're ordering, I don't think. I mean, do you realize the number one most ordered item on the menu, the gordita? Do you realize in Spanish, gordita means little fat girl? Did you know this? It's true. So how many of you people are going through the drive through lane going, I'd like three little fat girls on some flatbread, please? It's crazy. This is the kind of stuff that worries me. We bought a pickup truck one time when we lived in Houston. And um, big truck. It was a Ford a Dually truck. It was a Power Stroke diesel F-350. It was a truck. I named it Bubba, you know. Because you're not going to name that Lawrence, you know. So I, I name it Bubba. And I'm driving Bubba home, and I left the headlights on. And I went to open the door, turned it off, and as I'm starting to step out, Bubba goes, ding, your rights are on. Ding, your rights are on. Okay, this Chinese woman's voice comes out of Bubba telling me my rights were on. I begin to worry. I'm thinking there is a Chinese demon in the truck, and so I'm like slapping the dashboard, come out, come out, just trying to figure out what's happening. I'm calling Debbie out there, I'm calling a buddy of mine next door, I'm going, what's happening in there? Apparently there's somebody stuck in the glove compartment, something's going on, and they were just like, Jeff, settle down, dude, it's probably just some little computerized thing. I end up having to call Ford over it, because I'm driving Debbie crazy. And so I was like, can you tell me why my, my car is talking like this? And they just said, oh, it wasn't a popular feature, it turns out. It was this talking module that we had. And it was just to tell you things like your lights are on, you're running out of gas. And went, well, of course it's not a popular feature because it's not natural. It should talk like the part of the country in which I bought it if you're going to do this. So they were like, okay, sir, thank you very much for calling. So I don't know, maybe my worrying will pay off for some of you guys. Maybe they'll try it again and they'll take my idea. And maybe if you buy a car in Texas and you leave your lights on, maybe because of me, your car would say, hey, your lights are on. Um, or if you like buy it in North, maybe in Miami, which is like North Cuba, and you leave your lights on, your car would say, las luces están perdidas, you know? Or <laughs> buy it in New Jersey, it'd say, yo, 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 you lights is on, you know? <laughs> in San Francisco, your lights are so turned on, you know, I don't know. Um, but, I don't know, but uh, I worry a lot. I know that. Well, there's other things that, you know, our parents do that sometimes it's difficult to, to live with. Um, dads who cannot dress themselves for public showing. Anyone have this problem? They, they can't match their clothes together very well. It's on not their that they're own. colorblind. They're just okay. blind. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Now, actually, I started fixing this when I was a teenager because I started helping my dad put his outfits together. I'd be like, Dad, this is a good shirt to go with these pants. And yeah. yeah tell him about what your mom would have to do for him when you go on a trip, though. This is this pathetic. Well, it really my is. dad would travel a lot for work. And so he got used to us putting his outfits together. So, yes, my mother would put a little safety pin with a number on it. 
a number one on his shirt with the number one on his pants that he was supposed to wear on the first day, and then safety pins with twos on them for the second. It was actually very embarrassing. It's like but. Garanimals for grown up. How, how <laughs> sad is that? That is sad. How many of you have moms who say stuff that make absolutely no sense whatsoever, especially if she's mad, she just says things that just doesn't make any sense, and you get in trouble if you laugh over it? Okay, and, wait a minute, wait, 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 wait. Yeah. I just want you to know that as a mother, I can explain this, okay? When we start making no sense whatsoever, we know we're not making sense. But we think if we keep talking, eventually we will make sense. And that's why we keep on and on and on. You just dig in the hole deeper. <laughs> okay, and so but you know, it doesn't help when you and the children are racing to see who can be behind me laughing while I'm trying to make sense of my own conversation. Yeah, me and the kids, we've kind of gotten this contest going of seeing who could kind of be back behind mom so we can enjoy the laughter of the comedy show she's putting on and the other kids can't laugh, you know, because if they laugh, they get in trouble. So we try uh -oh. to figure out who can get behind her first. <laughs> let, let me explain this on behalf of the moms, kids. You need to understand what happens here. Um, a little biology lesson that's not taught in schools. It should be. Every time a woman has a baby, Part of her brain leaves her body with the baby. That is not yes, true. Yes, it's true. It's absolutely true. So if you have like three or four brothers and sisters, at this point, your mom's mentally handicapped and you should be Stop. very nice to her. That is just wrong. Man, my mom was like this and it would like start the same way and it would end the same way. She'd say like, oh, young man, you look like you need a whipping to me. And I'd say like, Seriously, I didn't know I had a beat me face, Mom. Really? Can you take me to the mirror and show me what that looks like? And then she'd get all mad and she'd say, Oh, very funny, Mr. Funny Man. I tell you what, you've got an attitude. How many of you have been accused of having an attitude? Any, Any? teenagers? Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. On behalf of all the teenagers' parents, you have attitudes too. They just can't tell you that. So, uh, so she would tell me I have an attitude and then she'd say, You go to your room and you prepare for a spanking. Okay, now what does that mean exactly? Does that mean go in there and get spread eagle on the wall, you know? Paint a target on your rear end, put some landing lights, help her bring that baby home. So I'm the guy that's in there thinking, get ready for a spank. I'm the guy that figured out Charmin is squeezably soft. You can get like <laughs> 10 rolls of toilet paper stuffed in your pants if you push real hard. So my mom would walk in, it looks like I've got a, you know, hiney tumor, and um, she'd get all oh, mad. She'd say, you get that out of your pants, and you go to your father's closet, and you find something for me to spank you with. Okay, here's what that meant. That meant pick a belt. Mm. Now, no, you kids today call this child abuse. Back then, we called this love. That's um, right. <laughs> now, you had two different kinds, categories of belts. You, you got your fat belts, which frankly don't hurt that bad. It's just the sound they make on contact makes you think your, your mom just fired a cannon at your backside. And then you got the skinny belts. It, they, they're not that menacing to look at, but they will put a welt on the back of your thigh to keep you from sitting down for like a week. So I'm in my dad's closet again and i'm trying to figure out what i'm supposed to get and her words kind of replay in my head go to your father's closet and find something and i'm thinking well how many times she said something i keep coming out here with the belt like an idiot so now i'm thinking outside the belt and so i look around the closet i see one of my dad's dirty socks on the floor of the closet and so i, I took it in to my mom i said here mom beat me silly and uh, my mom didn't laugh as i recall <laughs> at, at that I found out in that moment, my mother was a ninja warrior uh, at some point. Um, because all of a sudden, she had this death grip she grabbed my bicep with that was able to cut off circulation to the entire side of my body. Do any of your parents have this ability to grip parts of your body and paralyze you instantaneously? Or, or they'll, you know, like get that one little part on the back of your neck and you'll feel like you're paralyzed. Or, or during church, they just give you the eye. You know, the one that says, if you don't stop, yeah. Jesus will see you soon. Yeah, that that look, you know. Yeah. So she would grab my arm. Now, I don't know what she thought I would do with the free arm. I don't know if she thought I would just slip it in my pocket <laughs> while she commenced to beating me. But I did what any halfway intelligent kid would do. I tried to cover as much acreage as possible mm. with the free hand. This is how I learned to palm a basketball, was just out of self-defense. So now she's she's committed to lecturing me and spanking me at the same time while removing my hand and it would never go well. She'd say like, I told you, move your hand. Don't you ever do that. I can't do you understand. 
like me and the short circuits going off in her brain and her hair's freezing out and I'd be like no mom I don't understand you repeat it five more times let's keep doing the hoedown so <laughs> it's really sad how all this happens and the scary thing is you guys are going to be doing the same thing to your children we call this a generational curse <laughs> so tonight we want us just to figure out okay we all make mistakes we're all fairly clueless when it comes to doing our part in the family because none of us were given a lot of training. None of us were given, uh, you know, we didn't have to get a license to be a parent, unfortunately. You didn't have to get a license to be a kid. But we are called somehow to work in unity. And especially over something as important as purity, it's going to take us working in unity. So we want to give you lots of chances tonight just to laugh at the fact that we're all imperfect, that we all struggle, and to be able to figure out how we work together in spite of all those imperfections. And tonight we want to start with just a quick table discussion, just the people right there where you are, and talk about, teens, this is the question we want you to answer. What's one of the embarrassing habits that we just talked about that you've seen in your parents or maybe your friend's parents? That's a little safer, right? And then parents, What's one of the things you said you would never do when you were growing up, but now that you're a parent, you're doing it? You don't mean to, but, okay? Talk with your table. <laughs> 